We want to continue our worship service in song. We also want to welcome those who are joining us via live stream. We're thankful that you can join us in this way and trust that God has a special blessing for you this morning as well. Why don't you stand? We will turn to our call to worship. I'll read the leader portion and you can respond with the people portion. Our call to worship is based out of Psalm 144. O Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the son of man that you think of him? For we are like a breath, and our days are like passing shadows. Blessed be the Lord. He is our steadfast love and our fortress. He is our stronghold, deliverer, and shield. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord.
Father, we thank you that by your Son, through your Spirit, you are here present with us. And we pray for those hearts that are longing and needing a special word, a touch, a reminder from you that you are with them. Would you come? And would you be near to us? Would you encourage our hearts as we move closer and closer to that celebration of your coming as a baby? And may it encourage our hearts to look forward to that coming of yours again as King of kings and Lord of lords. Where you will say, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Thank you for your goodness. We pray this in your name. You can take a seat. On the first Sunday of Advent, we focused on Jesus, whose name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. On the second Sunday of Advent, we focused on Jesus, whose name shall be called Mighty God. This morning, we anticipate the coming of Jesus, whose name shall be called Everlasting Father. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, the living God. My tears have been my food day and night, and they say to me all day long, where is your God? Behold, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Everlasting Father. I have been your dwelling place in all generations. I am from everlasting to everlasting. Before I brought the mountains forth, and before I formed the earth, my throne was established. Before I formed your inward parts, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I knew you. I taught you how to walk and took you by the arms, but you didn't know it was I who healed you. I led you with cords of human kindness and with ties of love. I lifted you to my cheek like a father his child. I bent down and fed you. I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I will continue my faithfulness to you. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Neither can I forget you, for I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. I know when you sit down and when you get up. I know all of your thoughts ahead of time and all of your words before you speak them. I wrote of all your days in my book before any of them came to be. I protect you on every side and my hand is upon you, for I know your frame. I remember that you are dust. As we light this candle, we depend on you, everlasting Father, to lead us by the hand through the trials and triumphs of this life. As we light this candle, we trust that as our everlasting Father, you know us better than we know ourselves and your plans for us are good. And as we light this candle, we thank you that when we receive you and believe in your name, you give us the right to become your children. As we light this candle, we declare that you, Jesus, are the Everlasting Father. Good morning, everyone. It's almost Christmas. And I, uh, I realized from previous years that 
Christmas is a time where people want to, uh, they're in the business of saving money. They're looking for deals. That's why you have all that advertising of black this and early that and whatever else. And uh, people spend a lot of money. Well, I got a fantastic deal on Thursday. I just want to share this one with you because it's kind of personal. I went and I gave a guy 20 bucks for a haircut and he took $30 worth of hair. <laughs> when I came out of that shop, the wind whistling around my ears, I said, uh, maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all. But here I am. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that's where we are today, and as was already mentioned, we've looked at the Wonderful Counselor and the Mighty God in previous Advent services, and today we want to focus on this child to be born as the everlasting father. The word everlasting by dictionary definition is defined as something that lasts forever. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? But one of the dictionaries also had eternal in that definition. Continuing without limit into the future is what lasting forever really means. Eternal has a little different definition, which we will get into further on into this morning's message. Or lasting continually or for an indefinite period of time. Have you ever bought something that you had hopes of lasting forever? No? Anybody? How about for your lifetime? You bought a lot of stuff that had a lifetime warranty. But then as it broke apart, you asked the question, okay, whose lifetime was this? It wasn't mine because I witnessed it breaking down, right? Well, those hopes are often dashed by the item falling apart or the owner of the item, he may have passed on before he gets to see the longevity of this item. And I'm wondering if that may be the case with a, with a deep freeze that me and my wonderful wife bought back in 1975 at the McLeod store in Fort McMurray, 350 bucks. It has provided us with going on 48 years of trouble-free service. It's a true story. My wife will gladly witness. And uh, I believe my wife has uttered a few words of hopeful failure of this freezer dreaming of an upgrade. You know those, those vertical ones? But by the grace of God, I've managed to counter some uh, rather... Uh, strategic conversation regarding the beauty of this freezer, and I've convinced her slowly but surely that we should keep it till death do us part. As far as Christmas gift advertisements, I did find one, one organization that said this, 18 gifts that will last forever, or almost in brackets. Extremely close. Well, that's not the case with the prophecy that we're looking at this morning of Isaiah 9.6. In its context of Isaiah's prophecy, this verse is proclaiming the redemption, the redemption of Israel and the activities, titles, and blessings of the Messiah who is to rule the earth. He will also usher in a reign of blessing and peace upon the earth that will have no end, as we sang in the song. It will last forever. Of all the names given to this child in Isaiah 9, 6, Everlasting Father seems to be the hardest one to understand. And I'm not saying that so that you're supposed to throw in a pity party for me or anything like that, but I have... I have spent considerable time scratching my head on this one because I did find it to be an overwhelming title. But let's pray that by the grace of God we'll come to a better understanding of what it means throughout this morning. 
How could this child that would be born Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead, also be called Everlasting Father? God the Son is certainly not an interchangeable name with God the Father. In the Gospels, we hear God confirming that Jesus is His Son. And Jesus making reference to His Heavenly Father many times, indicating that His Father is indeed Father God of the Trinity. At Jesus' baptism, immediately after the event took place, the heaven was opened, and the Spirit of God came down like a dove on lightning on Jesus, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. In John 17, 4 and 5, Jesus says this to his Father. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Before the world began? Jesus was already enjoying glory with God the Father before the world began. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 6, and 7, he says that Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. We see here that both God the Father and Jesus the Son, they make a distinction of their respective roles in the Godhead. Jesus being called everlasting Father does not mean that the Son is also the Father. There is one God in three persons in the Godhead existing in perfect unity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are identical in essence, but each has a different function or role in the Godhead, but they are equal in power and glory. The Father, for example, is presented as the source, the sender, the planner of salvation. The Son, on the other hand, is the means, the sent one, and the achiever of salvation. The Father sent the Son, the Son came to save us, the Father planned it, but the Son accomplished it on the cross. The Holy Spirit is sent by the Father in the name of the Son, according to John 14, 26, where we read, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. He will also give new birth to our spirit, as we read in John 3, 5, and 6, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. It is only possible to be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Father is the planner, the Son accomplishes the plan, and the Holy Spirit applies salvation by transforming the hearts of believers unto salvation. The Father is the source the Son is the means, and the Holy Spirit achieves by convicting, convincing, and converting. The Holy Spirit is also a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance of salvation, according to Ephesians 1, 13, and 14, where the Apostle Paul says this, He's encouraging his readers in Ephesus, saying, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, 
You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The Hebrew phrase translated everlasting father could also be translated literally as father of eternity. Interestingly, among the Jews, the word father means originator, source. For this reason, the title means that this coming Messiah, the anointed one, is also the creator of all things. We sang that also in a song. I was looking at some of the theology in the Psalms. It's beautiful. It's beautiful theology in there. It, un it, it unravels a lot of questions that we may have if we sing these old songs over and over. He is the father of time and eternity. He is the architect of the ages. And we know this to be true from the New Testament, where we read in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, which tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Everything that we see around us that we admire, things that we may not even appreciate about this planet Earth, were all created by Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17 we read, for by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In the Hebrew word construction of this phrase, everlasting father, father is the primary noun, and everlasting is the term that describes his fatherhood. He is father forever. The Hebrew translated everlasting has the idea of without end. And I believe that's the same as it is for us when we speak of everlasting in English. We're looking at everlasting into the future. And the next verse says this of, my, of the Messiah in uh, Isaiah 9, 7. It says, of his greatness, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. The emphasis here in verse 7 is forward-looking into the future since Isaiah is proclaiming an event that is still to take place in the distant future. So everlasting is probably a better translation for this context for sure, which not only indicates eternity, sorry, eternal indicates without end, but also without beginning. But Isaiah here is prophesying an event in the future, and he's using everlasting Father. Again, in the New Testament, we know that the Messiah is without beginning, but that is not the emphasis here in the context of Isaiah. For as the, so as the everlasting father, the Messiah will be a father and his fatherhood will be without end. Many rulers in the ancient times, they considered father of, or considered father of a country. And interestingly, something that I did read, I found out that George Washington was seen as such in the United States back in the day. In ancient times, father of the nation was viewed in much the same way as, as father of a family. It was the father who was to protect and provide for his children. In the same way, this child to be born will become a king who will be a father to the children of Israel 
and he will protect and provide for them. Disappointingly and discouragingly, I did discover in my study of this topic that in North America, there is, or in the U.S., there is more than 50% of black homes that do not have any father present. More than 50% of the homes of black Americans do not have a father present. A very sad piece of information that I came across. It was the father who was to protect and provide for his children. That's the mandate of God given to the male race as fathers. And his whole role as protector and provider will not be limited by aging or death, this eternal father, everlasting father. His role as father will continue on forever. Just how this will come about is, is not revealed in Isaiah's prophecy see, specifically, but the full identity of this child to be born in Isaiah's prophecy leaves much room and thought for faith to be exercised. That he is God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity who would protect and provide for his people by his death and resurrection on their behalf, and that the Gentiles could also be grafted into the family of Israel it may be hinted at in this prophecy of Isaiah, but God's people would have to wait approximately 700 years to see the Messiah revealed in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, the prophecy would be fulfilled, and we see that in Galatians 4.4, where we read the Apostle Paul's words to the Galatians when he says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. God is a patient God since he is eternal, beyond time. He seems to be extremely patient, to have people wait 700 years for the fulfillment of a major prophecy. But we need to remember that with God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. I encourage the early service by saying, you know, if you want to take that and put that in your memory bank and really digest that. And if you go and look into the mirror and you see some of these aging wrinkles appear, which happens after 21, then you can be encouraged by telling yourself, you know something, on God's calendar, I'm not even a day old. These are just baby wrinkles. So encourage yourself with that, folks. The eternal God does not make appointments by way of a time clock as we do. He exists beyond time. Could that maybe be why we're so impatient with God? You ever find yourself being impatient with God? We're bound by time and tasks and trouble. We want our prayers answered right now. Have you ever had those kind of prayers? We prayed a number of prayers here, Russell did, and and some of those prayers may take a lot of patience. God's time clock works different than ours. As a matter of fact, I shouldn't use the word clock in connection with God because he's beyond time. The Apostle Peter reminds us of something that is critically important concerning God's patience. In 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9, where we read these words. Peter says... Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. For what reason? 
He does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's why God is so patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. So what does that mean, you may ask? Well, the word repentance in the Bible literally means the act of changing one's mind. True biblical repentance goes beyond remorse and regret or feeling bad about one's sin. It involves more, more, merely, more than merely turning away from sin. I found this definition, which I liked in, in Erdman's Bible Dictionary. It says, repentance in its fullest sense is a term for a complete change of direction involving a judgment upon your past and a deliberate redirection of your future. If you're heading down the road of sin and destruction, which many people are on, and they're traveling at breakneck speed, not acknowledging it, you need to turn onto the road of repentance for deliverance. That's the instruction from God's word to you and to me. Why is this important? Well, I think that the Apostle Peter gives us a good reason in the second letter that he writes toward the end of his life. 2 Peter 3, 1 to 14. Peter says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. That's the purpose of his letter. He wants us to think wholesome thoughts. Why? Because there will be some major events that will take place in the future, Peter tells us. He says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. He's indicating there that the words that the prophets and the apostles spoke they have equal authority. They're both given by God to the people. Above all, he says, verse 3, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And they will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Things haven't changed. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Peter says that the scoffers they're accompanied by their evil desires and their arrogant snobbery toward the idea of the coming judgment, which led them to sexual perversion. The scoffers argued that in a universe governed by natural laws, miracles simply cannot happen. Therefore, they said, Jesus Christ could not come again. That's why he's not showing up. We've been waiting for many years and nothing's changed, they said. They also forgot that God used the water for the purpose of the construction of earth and will use it, or did use it, for the destruction of the ungodly, unrepentant sinners, some of which helped Noah build the ark. I looked at this and I said, these folks had 120 years of employment, some of them. By the way, those folks lived a, long, a little longer than we do nowadays. But Noah spent 120 years in building this ark, and these people were working for this guy, and he's the evangelist of the planet. And he's, he's telling him, folks, there's going to be a flood coming, something you've never seen before. And I know it'd be a little hard to grasp because they lived in a time when when, when there wasn't such a thing as two or three or four or six or eight or ten inches of rain coming down. 
They had never seen that. They had never experienced it. So they didn't believe what this fellow was telling him, but they were thankful for the paycheck they were receiving because it was probably one of the larger projects on the planet at the time, 120 years in the making. So they mocked him. They didn't believe what he said. But then Peter says, by the same word that God spoke to Noah and that Noah spoke to the people, the present heavens, he says, and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. I found in my reading that they estimate approximately, and these are estimations, so don't hold me to it, there could have been as much as 750 million people on the planet, or perhaps two or three billion. That's a lot of folks. That's a lot of folks that were considered ungodly and that drowned in the flood. Only eight souls were saved of the entire population of the planet. Peter goes on to say, he says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. No more secrets. No more hidden agendas. Everything will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? And Peter answers that question. He says, you ought to live holy and godly lives. We're challenged to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. I see God here holding the earth on a bit of a layaway plan for a time. Storing it up like a treasure for fire and kept for judgment. The day of the Lord, Peter says in verse 10, it includes the tribulation the millennium, the great white throne judgment, and the destruction of the present heavens and earth. I know you have a hard time with it because I also have a hard time with it because we cannot fathom everything that we know to absolutely disappear. It's unthinkable. And the finite mind, which mine is, and I trust yours is the same, it absolutely runs into a roadblock of thought. And I have to put faith into action and say, God's word says it, so I believe it. Amen? At the great white throne, after the millennium, the ungodly men and women will be judged and thrown into the lake of fire according to Revelation. This is not the most encouraging passage of Scripture, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm giving it to his homework for this afternoon. Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15. Read it over a dozen times. It's the reality of what's going to happen in the future. Guess who is seated on this throne as judge? Guess who is seated on this throne as the judge on this white throne judgment? Any takers? Anybody care to guess? He's one that has many names. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. 
the Prince of Peace. And you say, that doesn't make any sense. And I don't blame you for saying that or having those thoughts. I've had them many times myself. But when, when, we, when we unfold the picture a little further, it makes perfect sense. In John 5, to 24, Jesus says this, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged. That's the best news of the day. He that believes in him who sent me, Jesus says, has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Amen? Somebody's tracking with me. Praise God. Thank you, young fellow. I'm not counting the rest of you out. Back to 2 Peter 3.13. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's a new heaven and a new earth promised, ladies and gentlemen. So then, dear friends, Peter says, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. And by now, you may be asking the question, how can you be at peace with God? That's a legitimate question. By admitting that you are a sinner and that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. That is how you can be at peace with God. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. That's why he's patient. And he's still waiting even today. For sinners to acknowledge that they're sinners and that Jesus Christ is the Savior. How can you be at peace with him? Well, Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Do you ever... Do you ever picture yourself for a moment, if you can handle it? Do you ever picture yourself standing before a holy and righteous God, the creator of the universe? That you stand before him alone? No family members, no co-workers, you alone before a holy God, the creator of heaven and earth, and you included. I go there, and I shudder. There is one requirement that makes it possible for a created being to stand before a holy God. And that is the robe of righteousness that you can only receive by exercising faith in Jesus Christ. 
You need to be clothed with his righteousness. And without it, you will melt before a holy God who created the universe. If you're not clothed in this righteousness, you are in the biggest trouble you will ever, ever experience. We sing this old hymn, Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless I stand before the throne. That's the only way that you and I can stand before this holy God, faultless, when we're robed in his righteousness, received only through grace by faith in Jesus. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. So we see that Jesus as the everlasting Father, he's the one who gives us eternal life by his death, burial, and resurrection, and he's brought life and immortality to light. He was delivered over to death for our sins, Romans 4.25, and was raised to life for our justification. The significance of Jesus Christ's resurrection is extremely important because had he not, we would not be able to have this robe of righteousness that he offers us today. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. By faith in him, we can stand justified before the God of the universe. Truly, he is the everlasting father. Indicates that as a loving father provides for his children, so Jesus loves us and has provided for us by giving us eternal life. If you have not yet put your faith in this Jesus, this Emmanuel child, I encourage you, don't put it off. Do it today. You have no idea whether you will see Christmas. I don't have any idea whether I'll see Christmas. Our life is in the hand of the maker, the creator, God, eternal, existing in the heavens. As the everlasting Father, he will give you the very best Christmas gift that you have ever had. Having your sins forgiven is worth much more than any gift that anyone will ever give you or any gift you have ever received. Sins forgiven gives you access to heaven, only available through faith in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, because he loves you. He loves you, and he does not want anyone to perish, but every single one to come to repentance. Let's pray together. God in heaven, we thank you that you are God in heaven, the creator of the universe. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us to the extent that you have through your son, Jesus Christ, who came and revealed to us truth. The truth that we find in the word of God that we can meditate on here and now. The truth that tells us which way to go, what decision to make, what is the future holding in store for us, and what is the future holding in store for the ungodly. God, help us to take seriously the message of saving grace through faith in Jesus, and let us communicate that to others that still have not bought into your gracious plan for them. May we do it with concern with compassion and conviction. And may we ultimately do it for the honor and glory that belongs to none other than Jesus Christ, who gave his life as a ransom for us, for everyone. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our benediction is found in 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18. 
which reads like this, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. You are dismissed except for the people that are singing in the choir. There's a practice here immediately after the service. God bless you. Have a great week serving Jesus.